Afternoon, Daryl. Yeah, it's John again. Okay. I know you got sick and tired about doing his, uh, Atkins doing his war weekend warrior commercials. What about Gary Sinise? Now, Gary Sinise has been there, but he doesn't grift. He doesn't sound like he's grifting. He's still having a foundation donate like crazy and contributing to the veterans. Alive? and injured. You know, he's still catering to them. He hadn't served. I'd serve on it. I'd, I could donate to his foundation to help the other veterans if I could. I know my tax dollars aren't doing so damn well concerning about the Department of Veteran Affairs. <sighs> but I served a veteran, as I said before in my last video. I served him. All throughout my life. I didn't even realize it. He was my brother. Literally. I said in my other videos I talked about him. Yeah, I'll talk about him again on this one. David Warshaw. Born Dallas, Texas. Had Texas in his heart. But he sure as hell didn't like the way his state was going. I was for damn sure. He wasn't raised as a California. He was still Texan in his heart. Absence, starving as hell, fighter, defender. It was everything and anything. He wasn't perfect. He was a loudmouth asshole sometimes. He was a smart ass when he could be. <laughs> but this guy you can try depending upon like crazy because he did his damn best to help out whenever he could. Whenever he could. It was a good friend, my best friend, my big brother. Eight years older than I am. He would have been if he was still alive. And he would have that many more years of sobriety since 85. And he was damn proud of it, too. He was damn proud of it. You think he did more to help out fellow alcoholics and recovered than anything else he did in the military. He struggled. He wouldn't drink, he wouldn't use, but he had problems concerning about medications and he had to deal with the pain on a constant basis. He didn't want to be addicted to the damn stuff. The only thing that kept giving him was narcotic. Or close to it anyway. And he didn't like it as much, but he used it. He struggled. And me, I had to struggle along with him because I had to take care of a veteran. There was one story out there he told some of his veteran friends, and not to mention people in recovery, but not many people knew about it. They said it was declassified, but sometimes I wasn't quite sure about that one. Back in 83, they had the uh, U.S. Embassy blown to hell in Beirut, Lebanon. A lot of people got killed in there. Didn't matter if they're veterans or not. Didn't matter if they're military. They still got killed. Some lunatics drove in a few bands trying to blow the whole place up with them, packed with explosives. There was a firefight going on in there. My brother was sta not stationed, but he and uh, another unit that he was with did a performed a task. And they went to the embassy to rest and wait for pickup. And that's when the terrorists decided to blow the whole place up. They came in one at a time with the vans trying to drive into there. Their first van did the first job. Blew things to hell. Then all hell broke loose, my brother told me. He was uh, in a compound on property in the back waiting for the pickup. And that's when everything else just blown to hell. He got injured with shrapnel on in his back. 
His knees were screwed up in training exercises earlier on in his military career. But they gave him titanium. Both kneecaps. Still irritated to him when he got older. Rubbing a living crap on him because there was no cartilage. And he had a hell of a time trying to walk, let alone run, but he would run if he had to. It suck into damn pain. That's how he was trained when he was in the military. And he was telling me, during that time, when he got recalled for duty, he damn near lost his life in there. He had rebar sticking in him. They had to cut the damn rebar off of his back and put him through Man Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany to take care of him. But while the thing was happening in Beirut, he was involved with the firefight of his life. They prevented another explosion that would have taken out the entire compound and what was left of it. It was part of that. He didn't talk about it as much because it still scared the shit out of him. But here's the catch on this one here. It was verifiable every time he kept going through a metal detector. It didn't matter where. A damn thing would always would go off. And it's not just because of a belt buckle. Because he still had pieces of shrapnel right next to his damn spine. Now the doctors kept saying that they'll be able to take him out. But he'll be paraplegic. He wouldn't walk again. Took his chances. He asked the cops or arrest security guards to wand his ass every time he went into one of those metal detectors at uh, government buildings. Or wherever they had a metal detector, they'd go off, they'd wand his ass. He'd tell them. He was a wounded veteran with shrapnel. I saw the x-ray. Veterans walk in with a lot of pieces in their body. Physical reminders of hell. But it's not just the physical pieces, Daryl. It's the mental pieces as well. Since time immemorial, when mankind was trying to kill each other for one reason or another, we'd still have the haunting memories in us. Gotten more and more cute these days. If they have more and more mental health services happening for these guys because they find a way to pop off because they can't deal with it anymore. And it's not just since 9-11. Hell, if he had non-vets were doing it, not to mention the Korean vets, not to mention World War II veterans. And earlier than that, probably the Civil War veterans. Or earlier than that, the Revolutionary War. Or earlier than that, other other people popping up because they couldn't deal with it. It's gotten worse and worse these days because we've gotten better and better at killing each other. I'd seen my brother wig out for nightmares he went through that he couldn't even talk to the time he died. Up until the time he died, he kept some of the stuff to him inside unless he was talking to another veteran and away from me. And even sometimes they couldn't exactly converse. I mean, over the stand downs he would he and I would go to. And there have been a few of them I went to. Not to mention a lot of recovery meetings. There have been a lot of veterans in there too. But he talked to them a lot more in detail and away from me because these guys could relate with each other. There was one particular fellow that became close to my brother. And he had problems with his alcoholism in his life, but he was still a recovering, struggling alcoholic before he passed away. And he still had his sobriety. But he had been through a hell of a lot, and my brother could relate to him. But they'd both talk about it away from me, because I'm not military. It's not military-minded. It's not serving. And hadn't been in combat. I had my own issues, that's all. 
And sometimes I was so jealous and envious about my brother. I was so damn jealous and envious of him. I wanted to serve. I wanted to understand. I don't think I could anymore. I don't think I could understand the hell that I went through. It probably wasn't for me to understand it anyway. Because I probably would cap myself. I probably would. But I'd seen my brother wake out a couple of times. Scariest damn thing. He'd wake up from a dream. He didn't know where the hell he was. Didn't know who the hell I was until I got him calmed down enough. I talked to him slowly, calmly. He was looking for a weapon to kill me. He finally realized what the hell was going on and broke down. That's why I was able to recognize the PTSD in me. He finally recognized the damn thing. Not just because of a tire falling on my face, but because of all the shit I went through in my youth. Leading up to the point of a tire drop on my face that damn near killed me. But he, knew, he noticed the, the behavior pattern. It just clicked on him. Actually, vapor locked in a Walmart. There was a vapor lock in it. I didn't realize it until we get it to a 99 cent store, and that's when I really physically started doing it. I couldn't deal with it, couldn't handle it. <laughs> I worked in a Walmart, an automotive department. I didn't know shit from Shinola concerning about automotive. But I'm the counter guy that processes the orders, sales, God knows what else they got going on. But I couldn't install. I wasn't mechanically inclined. That, that's okay. They still needed a storefront in the automotive area to ring you up for oil, ring you up for tire sales. Unless they know how to do it during those days. I had to tell you if your tire was sucked or not. Just because of the tread. And sold you tires. One particular set, damn near cost my life. Four truck tires. Thick ones. And because of management, I damn near died. So yeah, there was a hell of a lot of resentment against the corporation, against the, uh, my store, and against some of the people in there. I still have to work on that damn shit. And this was over 10 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago. March will be about 11 or 12 years, I think. 2012, so you know, I'll tell you something about 12 years. Once in a while, I'll run into the nightmare of it. I'll feel the feelings. I'll feel everything else happening. I don't go ever, even to their website these days, because I still, if I happen to see the name Walmart, trigger alert. So I know what veterans are going through when they get, when they get triggers one way or another. We all have it. We get trauma happening in our life. Our subconscious can't deal with it. Bingo. We're screwed. I'm still feeling it right now, even as I speak. <laughs> Talking about this shit. At Walmart, so it's affecting me right now, even as I'm trying to communicate this on a video. 9-11 was one of those things. I would start talking about that damn thing. I start getting anxious about it. Blood pressure's going up. My pulse is racing. I'm starting to taste adrenaline in my mouth. I hadn't been triggered by a lot of bangs, except I can't deal with them anymore. I used to, but not anymore. You were complaining about if your opinions were unpatriotic. No. Not necessarily. You just have your own opinion concerning about Trace Atkins trying to capitalize on people's misery. Trying to support him, but still making money off the damn shit. I don't know if he's doing it for the goodness of his heart or not. If he was, fine, but if he wasn't, okay. 
This guy's going through shit. This guy's went through hell. Hearing these guys' the stories, they didn't have to say it. He looked it in their eyes. He looked in their eyes during those days. We felt it. I tried to get some kind of awareness of it. Dealing with my brother on a constant basis, I was starting to get a little bit of a feel for the damn thing. There's this one guy who lives in the apartment complex. He's got to be in his 40s, and he's having more PTSD issues than anything else. He very t barely talks to anybody that he can. He looks at me in pure terror. I hadn't said or done anything to him. Every time we kept trying to talk to him, it's like, and he'd been shell-shocked. He went over, did a tour or two, also had family issues, lost family. He lost a hell of a lot of things living with his mother right now. I forgot what this guy, this veteran's name was, but yeah, he's walking with it. He's walking shell-shocked. He's a zombie. Barely talks to anybody. Somewhere in there, there's a fight still going on for sanity. Somewhere in there. I wish I could help him out, but I don't know what the hell I can do for the guy. Except pray for the guy. And for the caregiver. He was taking care of him. We could talk, but he doesn't want to talk. But that's all right. That's all right. Let him be. Yeah, Daryl, I, uh, I may not have gone into combat. I've had my own issues all my life. I had to be the big boy trying to struggle with it all. But these days, each day if I'm still waking up and I'm still alive and I'm still breathing, that's got to be a good day right there. As for being patriotic, someone else's mind game right now. I can have disagreements with my country's policies, with the administrations, anything else, and everything. But the country, for its meaning, for what it stood for, what it tried to stand for, what was instilled in me a long time ago, I still hold true to it. It still has meaning and relevance. The idealism, the ideal of it. Sometimes the administrations you'll have disagreements with. And there's been plenty. There's been plenty. But Daryl, you ain't you are not unpatriotic. We have to question. We have to question. We have to challenge. That is our that is our duty, that is our right. And that is what what we must do. We are citizens of this country. It's our job to question our leaders. It's our job to question everybody. But not hold them over a spit and fire and to say, you will tell me the secrets or otherwise. We're turning in a barbecue. We got sauce for you. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Just talking about all this stuff is still, is still fritzing me up. I hardly ever talk to anybody these days, I'll tell you that much. I hardly ever go out, except when I do, I take out my dog. Some days are good days, and other days are a pain in the ass. Even if some people are still trying to get my attention, I'm still a pain in the ass. Some days are good days, and other days I stay the hell away from people. It sucks. This is what I've been turning out to be. I'm talking about my own damn PTSD flaring up like crazy. You're not crazy, Daryl. You're not unpatriotic. You still hold America to your core. What it stands for for you. At least we're not going up here maggot at this point over here and saying you have to believe or otherwise we're going to yeah, fill in the blank on that damn shit. 
We've seen too many of these damn things going on. Anyway, I blathered enough. Okay, we'll talk at you later, and right now I'll just have a conniption fit with my PTSD.